Well, good morning. If we could turn, please, to the book of Galatians and the second chapter. I'm going to read the first 10 verses as we consider uh, Paul's trip to Jerusalem. Going up to Jerusalem, I suppose, would be a good title, up to Jerusalem. And uh, we're going to consider the reasons he went up there and what took place. So beginning in verse 1, it says, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these, who seem to be somewhat Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. But they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. As we consider this passage together, we already observed, I think, at the end of last week's study, that there's considerable discussion and considerable debate about what visit this was to Jerusalem. Uh, was this... Uh, the visit that is found in Acts chapter 11, uh, when they went up with money for the poor saints in Jerusalem, or was this Acts chapter 15, where they went up for what is often known as the Jerusalem Council? And uh, as we discussed it last week, I mentioned that in my uh, thoughts, it seems likely that it was the one in Acts 11, because for one reason, uh, I think that if he it was the one in chapter 15, he would have mentioned the intervening visit in chapter 11, but he just says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem, as if there was no other visit in between. And so we don't know of any other visit except the one here in Acts chapter 11. And so that surely would have been mentioned. Secondly, at the Acts 15 one, uh, remember there was a letter given by the apostles stating very specifically that the Gentiles were not to be put onto the, under the law. And surely if if Paul had received that letter, he would have used it as he's writing to the Galatians because it deals exactly with the issue that's going on in Galatia. And so all he needs to do, in a sense, is produce that document from the apostles to say that Gentiles are not to be placed under the bondage of the law, but he produces no such letter. And so it would seem to me that it is the visit that takes place in Acts chapter 11. So we want to consider that uh, and look at it from that perspective. Now, I just want to mention something about chapters 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 1, which we've already considered, reveals to us the divinely given credentials of Paul's ministry. And so we saw that he got his apostleship directly from the risen Christ, and he got his gospel directly from the risen Christ. So he's presenting his divinely given credentials. But here in chapter 2, he is presenting his humanly given credentials. And what we're going to see is that the apostles at Jerusalem, and this is the whole point of this chapter, 
ultimately gave him the right hand of fellowship. And so they added nothing to him. They made no amendments, no corrections, no additions to his gospel. Uh, but they did give him the right hand of fellowship to say, we are in agreement fully with you in your ministry. And so it's his uh, humanly given credentials that he has the full agreement of the apostolic group in Jerusalem. So that's why this chapter is so very important for us to understand. And so we break in again. Uh, and verse one, we, we mentioned again last time that 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. We're going to see uh, there's a specific reason for Titus being there. He's going to be a test case in this matter of uh, do we have to circumcise Gentiles? But also uh, just the idea that everything has to be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So he didn't travel alone, but he took with him two associates uh, Barnabas and Titus, who could verify the events that took place. So here we've got, again, uh, properly accepted witnesses in terms of these uh, two or three witnesses. Notice verse 2. It says, I went up by revelation. Uh, in other words, his his journey up there wasn't that he was summoned by the apostles in Jerusalem to give an account of himself or his gospel or anything other than the fact that he was directly guided by God, the Holy Spirit, to go up to Jerusalem. Now, again, I think this plays in, in my mind, to the idea that this was the visit uh, to do with the funds for the poor saints at Jerusalem, because there was divine revelation given. If you look back at Acts 11, I want us to just go back there for a moment. Uh, we're saying that this is the visit that's in view and I want you to notice in Acts 11, we'll begin reading in verse 27. It says, in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so it would seem that part of this, I went up by revelation, is in connection with this a prophecy of Agabus, talking about the great dearth that was coming, and therefore uh, the Christians in Antioch took a collection uh, to be taken up to the poor saints of Jerusalem, and Paul and Barnabas were men designated to carry this uh, gift to the Christians. And so perhaps that's part of where that I, he says, I went up by revelation. There was, there was definitely divine direction involved in it. Interesting, when we get to the second part of the chapter, chapter 11, Peter coming down to Antioch, there's no mention of him coming down to Antioch by revelation. But Paul goes up to Jerusalem by revelation. The Lord is directing him to go there. And certainly, notice it also says, I went up by revelation and communicated with them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. And again, we say that if this would have been Acts 15, there was nothing private about the discussions about the gospel in Acts 15. All the elders and all the apostles and the saints were gathered together to discuss that matter. It was definitely not private. This is private. And so it's a private, uh, as he goes up there to take money for the poor saints, there's a private meeting uh, that takes place where the discussion concerning his gospel takes place. And so he says, I went by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. The word communicated there has the meaning of setting up for the consideration of others. Uh, he didn't go in a confrontational spirit, although he went out of deep conviction and he just laid before them, as it were, the gospel which he preaches amongst the Gentiles. Sometimes it is wise, and we're going to see this as we go through. Sometimes if we can deal with things in a private matter, we should do. There's other times where things have to be dealt with publicly. When we get to the second part of the chapter, we're not involved in a private meeting. We're involved in a public confrontation, and, the, and there's a reason for that. 
private matters dealt with privately. Public issues, public sins, public errors need to be confronted in a public way. And so we're going to observe that as we go through. But this is all done privately. It was a matter uh, to be considered uh, just by uh, key individuals uh, and discussed amongst them. And so sometimes it's just wise to do that. If you have concerns in your assembly, uh, it's good to go and meet with the oversight privately and share with them, unless it's something glaringly public, then, of course, it requires public attention. But it ought to be certainly done in a very private way. And so he says, I went up by revelation, communicated unto them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. He's not implying that there was anything erroneous or defective about his gospel in any way. But his preaching was being threatened, as we're going to see, by false brethren. And so he had a deep concern for the welfare of his converts, and he didn't want the, the, the gospel that they had believed, that he had preached, to be undermined by these false brethren. And he, so he didn't want to have run in vain because these false brethren coming along and undermining everything that he is seeking to do would certainly uh, make the work there uh, very much frustrated. And so that's the reason behind it. It's not that he has any doubts about his gospel. He received it from the risen, glorified Christ. Uh, he, he knows it's the true gospel, but he is concerned about these false brethren and the impact that they could have upon his ministry. And so it's really out of uh, jealousy for the, the saints, concerned that they're going to progress and do well and, and not be stumbled in any way. And so he says, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Notice verse 3, he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek or a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. Now becomes very apparent why Paul brought Titus along on his Jerusalem trip. He was a test case. Would the Jerusalem apostles force the rite of circumcision on a Gentile believer? Paul knew that both Jews and Gentiles are accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ without any distinction and that the church should do the same. If Jews and Gentiles are accepted by God uh, based on just faith in Christ, then the church should accept Gentiles on the basis of just faith in Christ, not circumcision or adherence to the law. And so the apostles declared that this truth was, or the apostle declared this truth was affirmed in Jerusalem because Titus was not compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. To impose circumcision on Titus would be to deny that salvation was by faith alone and to affirm that in addition to faith, there must be obedience to the law for acceptance before God. The circumcision wasn't just a ceremony. It was a commitment to do the whole law. It was a it was a contract, really. It was saying, I'm committed to do the whole thing. And so uh, this is affirming uh, very clearly salvation is by faith alone, that uh, the, the addition, obedience to the law for acceptance before God is not required. Paul's point here is that the leadership in Jerusalem accepted Titus, a Gentile convert, even though he was not circumcised according to the law of Moses. This shows that the Jerusalem leadership accepted the gospel of grace as Paul preached it. And it's interesting, by the way, to make a comparison here. We want to just take a minute to do it, but let's look back at Acts chapter 16. Because Titus was not compelled to be circumcised, but it's almost, if you read this without thinking through the implications of it, you could almost see, think that Paul is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. Because in Acts 16, we read, we'll begin in verse 1, it says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and be behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, 
and believed, but his father was a Greek or a Gentile, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So we, we look at this and we say, what's going on here, Paul? Uh, why this seemingly contrad contradictory statement here? Well, Titus' circumcision as a Gentile was resisted because it was concerning salvation. The gospel of grace was at stake here. Timothy's circumcision as somebody who was partly Jewish, his mother was Jewish, was required as a matter of service. You see, it would be a real stumbling block for somebody who's Jewish, uncircumcised, when they went, you know, as they went preaching around, where did they go first? They went to the Jew first. They began in the synagogue. And if it was known that they had Timothy with them, and he was Jewish, uh, you know, because even just having a mom makes you Jewish, then uh, he wasn't circumcised. That would immediately cause people not to listen to the message. And so it was basically not wanting to be a stumbling block, wanting Timothy to be able to get a hearing uh, and a respected hearing amongst the Jewish synagogues that it was required that he be circumcised. But for Titus, who was a Gentile, resistance. We are not going to allow this to take place. In fact, tells us why there was pressure to do this. It says in verse 4, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. Significant that Paul calls these men, false brethren a very severe title and again it's connected with what he wrote in chapter one if anyone preaches any other gospel and the gospel that i preach let him be accursed and so these people have a different gospel it's faith in christ plus the law equals justification that's a false gospel it's a wrong gospel. Faith in Christ plus anything. If it's faith in Christ plus good works, that's why Catholicism's gospel is a false gospel because it's faith in Christ plus good works equals justification. Well, this is a false gospel. And so they're false brethren. Anybody who preaches a false gospel is false brethren. And so he calls them false brethren. And um, uh, of course, the interesting thing is they thought of themselves as true brethren. Because they opposed and contradicted the gospel revealed to Paul by the Lord Jesus, they really were false brethren. And notice it's, it's significantly, it says these men secretly brought in, they came in by stealth. It says false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty. They did not come to the meeting with a name badge that said false brother. <laughs> they they did not come in with a purpose statement saying, we have come to spy out your liberty in Jesus and to bring you into bondage. If they came with that, they wouldn't get across the threshold, right? But that's how the enemy is. He's very sneaky. And so people come in and they sneak in, and but they've got a hidden agenda. And that hidden agenda is to bring the people of God back into bondage. And so maybe these men had the best of intentions, um, they were, but they were dangerous men who had to be confronted. And I think, you know, Paul, before his conversion, he, he would say he had the best of intention. He thought he was serving God. And so these people think they have the right intentions, but they, they, they certainly do not. Their, their whole purpose is to undermine the liberty and to uh, to undermine the gospel itself. Now, I want you just to notice this sneakiness idea of false teachers. Look at Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter two, and verse one, it says, "But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in." damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bringing upon themselves swift 
destruction. Again, denying the Lord that bought them, denying the true gospel, but they're coming in, and how are they doing it? Privately, kind of privately. They're not coming in, and they're not doing it in the public. Often they, they, they'll they they'll have people around for lunch, and they'll begin to push their agenda, or they'll, they'll have separate Bible studies from the assembly Bible study where they push their, their doctrines. Now, look at uh, Jude, uh, and again, we'll see Jude chapter 1, of course, there's only one chapter in Jude, but verse 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we obviously see here there there's a need to be very careful in reception. Now, again, we, we want to say this. Reception is never intended to keep God's people from remembering Christ and meeting with God's saints. But there is a, a need to be exercised some care in reception and, and make sure that people are, are really saved and that they don't have a hidden agenda. And how are you going to find that out without talking to them and getting to know a little bit about who they are, what they believe, and where they stand. And I think we just we have to exercise some care here, because there's always a danger of people coming in sneakily. And again, they're not going to do it in the public meetings. They're going to do it in a very discreet, private way, but they're going to seek to take the saints away from the simplicity that's in Christ. And so there, there is a need of care, and we need to, and again, but a need of balance, uh, let me just say, I need a balance. Uh, sometimes it's heartbreaking uh, going with a letter and to an assembly and being made to sit back because you do not say shibboleth the way they say shibboleth. That's not what I'm talking about here. <laughs> that to me is totally wrong. What I'm talking about here is somebody who comes in and they haven't really been questioned about what they believe or where they stand and they could indeed come in with a very disruptive agenda. And so we have to exercise care. And uh, we've experienced that in person. <laughs> uh, certainly when we were in Ireland, uh, we did have somebody from a cult who tried to come in uh, to our meetings. We met him at the door. We talked to him. We tried to get his testimony. And it was the vaguest testimony any of us had ever heard. And I asked another brother to talk to him, and in the end, we asked him to sit back, and it turned out, as we talked to him further at Coffee Break, he was part of a group that practiced a group called The Family, who are definitely a cult, and he had come to our meeting because we had a lot of children, and he had a purpose and an agenda, and we're really glad we excised a little bit of care there, and and so, again, we just have to recognize these things. Notice verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, this is to these false brethren, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so when these false brethren tried to put pressure to have Titus circumcised, Paul says, we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. In other words, he withstood them. This is important. We're going to see later on in the chapter, he's going to even withstand Peter when Peter is carried away uh, by these false men. And so he, he withstands uh, uh, this pressure. We, we're not going to give an inch. Now, why? Is it because uh, Paul is stubborn or is he prideful? No, he tells us the reason he's making this stand, it's that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Gentile Christians like those in Galatia, we don't want you to be robbed of the truth of the gospel. That's why we have to stand against error. That's why we must not budge an inch when somebody comes in with an, a gospel that adds something to the work of Christ. We have to stand and we're not going to be subjected even for, for an hour so, again, we see something of the courage of the Apostle Paul to stand for truth. Truth that has been revealed, he is not going to give an inch on truth that has been revealed. And how we need to be firm, uh, we're living in a day of compromise. We're living in a day of uh, of great deception. 
how we need to be those that stand for truth. I, I love the idea of Martin Luther when the gospel was at stake. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Standing for truth when tremendous pressure is being exerted to compromise. But no, we must stand on the truth. And that's kind of the idea that's been brought before us here. So the result of Paul's visit is seen now uh, from verse 6 onwards. And we're really seeing his uh, basically him being confirmed in by the apostles in the rightness of his gospel and the legitimacy of his apostleship. And this is so important in relation to these false teachers that have come in amongst the Galatians to affirm that Paul's authority is genuine and accepted by the others and that his gospel was genuine, accepted by the others. And so there's going to be some, uh, as it were, human given affirmation to what had been given by the Lord earlier. And so it says, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now, interesting little verse here. Um, Paul knew that in his day there were leaders of high reputation, like famous Christians. Um, they didn't overly impress or intimidate the Apostle Paul. And he's even speaking about the apostles. Now, he's not doing it disrespectfully in any way. But what he's saying is it doesn't make any difference who a person is. It, it, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism. And so he's telling us the leaders in Jerusalem, they added nothing unto me, nothing to the gospel Paul preached or to the apostolic authority he possessed. Uh, and so the, the thought is simply this, that uh, Paul's apostleship and Paul's gospel didn't need any amendment or addition. Okay, these people added nothing to him. All they did was affirm the legitimacy that, that it was right. They agreed with him. They gave him the right hand of, of fellowship, but they really added nothing, nothing at all. Uh, and so con really confirming the truth of the legitimacy of Paul's gospel and apostolic authority. Paul's words are neither a denial of nor a mark of disrespect for their apostolic authority, he is simply indicating that although he accepts their office as apostles, he is not overawed by their persons as it was being inflated by the, the, the false teachers. And I think it's good to keep this in mind. So when these false teachers came into Galatia, one of the things that they're doing is they're saying that Paul was inferior to the, the men in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem apostles were of a higher caliber. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. I, in fact, I, I'm not intimidated by them at all. I received my apostleship from the risen glorious head of the church. I received my gospel from the risen heart, glorious head of the church, and I'm not going to be intimidated by any man. Yeah, in fact, they added nothing to me. There was nothing that they added in any way. And so what he's doing is really, he's not getting at the apostles. He's getting at this inflated view of the apostles that was being perpetrated by these false teachers. So it does seem that the Judaizers were exaggerating the status of the Jewish apostles at the expense of Paul's own position. Paul is not in any way depreciating the apostles, but rather the elaborate and exclusive claims made for them by the Judaizers. And so then he goes on in verse 7, he says, but uh, contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So the leaders of the Jerusalem church, and we're going to see in the next verse, verse 9, that that's James and Cephas and John. They accepted Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles, recognizing the gospel was committed to Paul as a sacred trust or stewardship. And so they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. And this idea of the sacred deposit 
had been entrusted to the Apostle Paul, and they accepted that just as a sacred deposit of the same gospel had been given to them for the gent uh, for the circumcision. It was given to him for the uncircumcision. So they acknowledged this stewardship had been given to Paul of the gospel. And so they approve Paul's ministry, knowing that Paul did not require the Gentiles to come under the Mosaic law to find favor with God, that they, they're fully accepting what his gospel is. And then he goes on and he says in verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. So again, they're affirming Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, Peter's main ministry was to the Jews. By the way, these distinctions are not hard and fast. We have to recognize that because Peter was the first person to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, right? In Acts chapter 10, he brought the gospel to Cornelius' household. Paul, although he has given the gospel to the, uh, the uncircumcision, Every place he goes, where does he go first? <laughs> to the Jew first. He goes to the synagogue. Acts 13, he's preaching in uh, the, the synagogue in Antioch, Pisidia. And so it's not saying that they don't speak to Jewish, or he doesn't speak to Jewish audiences because he does, or that Peter doesn't speak to Gentiles because he does. In fact, even Peter's general epistle, it includes the Christians in Galatia. Uh, as part of that letter, uh, if you read who he's writing to, it's Pontius and Galatia. So even these Christians would have got a letter from Peter. So it's not strictly speaking followed, but generally speaking, you would say Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. Peter's ministry was uh, directed primarily to the Jews. And again, it's not implying that there were two Gospels, one to the Jews and one to the Gentiles. There's only one Gospel. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. That message is true if you're a Jew or a Gentile. The only difference is that they were directed primarily to different audiences. No difference in content, only in recipients. Now, this is just an interesting aside. But what I find so fascinating, and again, probably because of my <laughs> Catholic background, but, but it's amazing that Peter, as the apostle to the circumcision, and so-called uh, popes of Rome are meant to be the successors of Peter. But throughout their history, they certainly have not done much to take the gospel to the circumcision. <laughs> in fact, just the opposite. Uh, in fact, the papacy... I'm reading a book right now called Constantine's Sword, and it's written by a Roman Catholic, and it's telling the story of how uh, the Catholic Church, since the days of Constantine, have constantly persecuted the Jewish people rather than preaching the gospel to them. And, uh, and so really, uh, it just shows the folly of this whole thing. Peter was given the apostleship to the circumcision. And yet here he is supposedly the first bishop of Rome, which is just total nonsense. So the reason the apostles concluded that Paul's commission was equal to Peter's was that God gave success to both of them. So notice this, he wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. In other words, God used Peter greatly in preaching to Jews. And again, isn't it interesting, God's sense of humor in it all? Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but just his ways are not our ways. Why would you pick a, a, a rude Galilean fisherman as your main minister to the Jewish people? And why would you pick a man who is a Pharisee of the Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, to go to the Gentiles? We would never have done it that way. We would have thought the rough Galilean might relate better because he lived in Galilee of the Gentiles. Remember that? Uh, the 10 cities, 10 Gentile cities up there in Galilee. Surely he would have more way of relating to them. And then this guy Saul of Tarsus, surely he would be far better uh, if he went to the Jews because he knows Judaism inside out. But again, we, we say 
God's ways and not our ways. And uh, he, his methodology turns human wisdom on its head over and over again. And it's just wonderful to recognize that, isn't it? Uh, that the way God works. But God gave success to both as they preached. And uh, he, he was blessing their ministry, re- wrought effectually. Uh, their ministry was very effective. Peter to the circumcision, the same ministry in me towards the Gentiles. And so, again, there's there's no lack here. God is using both men in mighty ways, affirming uh, both Paul's gift and calling was no different than Peter's gift and calling in the sense that God was using them both in a marvelous way. So now we, we come to verse 9. This one I find very fascinating verse. It says, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So in the Jerusalem assembly, there are three individuals, James, Peter, and John, who were recognized as pillars in the church. Now, I, I think this is a very challenging thought, isn't it? You see, what what does a pillar do? Well, in terms of a building, a, a pillar gives stability and gives strength to a building. It, it's, it's a burden bearer. Right, it's there to bear the burden, the weight of the the roof and all the rest of it. And so, pillars are really important. If you don't have pillars, uh, of, you know, and you have a significant roof, it's going to ultimately collapse. You have to have pillars. And if you have pillars that are, are going rotten, you have to take them out, and you have to put a, a a replacement thing there to hold the roof up until you can get the new pillar in. And so, this idea of burden bearers. And I was just thinking that there's a tremendous need in our day for pillars in the assemblies and what i'm observing as i travel is that a lot of our pillars in the assemblies are older men (laughs) and some of them are passing from the scene and it should be a real matter of prayer and exercise that the lord would raise up a new generation of pillars for the churches burden bearers men who will bear the burden of the work and the problem is that in many of our assemblies we're either burden bearers or sadly we're burdens (laughs) some saints are just burdensome they're troublesome Uh, they just create work and we might ask ourselves how do we fit into all of this Are we a pillar in the local church? Are we somebody who's dependable? Are we somebody who's stable? Are we somebody who's strong spiritually? Are we somebody that bears the burden of the work? May God raise up burden bearers, pillars for the churches today. This is a really important principle. But he talks about James, Cephas, and John, who seem to be pillars. They perceived the grace that was given unto me. In other words, they fully recognize what God had done in grace in giving both apostleship and the gospel to the apostle Paul. And so they fully recognize this. So they 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 understand it. They they perceive it. They they they're definitely of convinced of it uh, that that this grace was given to Paul, and to show that they understood. This grace was given to Paul. It says, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. And so they have, as it were, this great affirmation. They ministered in different spheres, but were in full fellowship with each other. That idea of right hand of fellowship is we're we're in full agreement. We're in full fellowship with you and what you're doing amongst the Gentiles we, as it were, are giving our right hand, our strength. We're, we're behind everything you're doing. And so we're giving to them the right hand of fellowship. So it's kind of like a commendation. They're commending them to that work. They're giving them the right hand of fellowship. And then notice verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor 
the same, which I also was forward to do. Of course, they've just demonstrated that by coming up from Jerus- uh, to Jerusalem uh, with a gift to the p- for the poor. But certainly, it's just interesting, isn't it, how Christianity historically has always been a caring, compassionate faith that has always shown care for the poor. And you you read the various ministries throughout the centuries, and they've always had that work amongst the poor. I just was reading Tyndale's biography recently, and while he was in Antwerp, uh, as well as busily doing his scholarly work of translating from the Hebrew into uh, the the New Testament into English, or the Old Testament into English, and the Greek into uh, the New Testament, and yet he would often go and minister amongst the poor of Antwerp, taking needed food, but also the gospel message. Uh, of course, we think of George Mueller and the orphans and his care for the orphans, and uh, we think of so many examples of this. And uh, we might ask ourselves, are we? And again, it's very challenging, isn't it? Are we remembering the poor? And I realize it's not simple. In fact, it's very difficult because sometimes people are poor because they make foolish choices. (laughs) People are poor because of substance abuse. People are poor for different reasons. But at the same time, the apostles at least give this recommendation that we should remember the poor the same which I also was forbidden to do. And of course, this is, you know, the Lord Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And we should always keep that in our minds. And it's challenging and it's difficult. And we need winsomeness and wisdom. Uh, You know, sometimes people come and they're asking for money and they're going to use it (laughs) for abusive means. And so we we need great winsomeness. We don't want to contribute to their delinquency. But how can we help? Well, perhaps we could take somebody, say, I'm not going to give you any money, but I'm going to take you and buy you lunch. Or um, some sisters I know, they they carry in the back of their vehicle uh, bags with socks and things like that. And if the homeless stop them, they'll give them a bag with a tract and warm socks and things like that. And they're... They're creative in the way that they are seeking to care for the poor. And it's a challenge, isn't it? I just came to me freshly as I was reading this this morning. Um, Lord, help us to know how to do this. We want to remember the poor. But at the same time, there's a great danger that that becomes our primary purpose. And that's never God's intent. The first thing that they perceived, the grace that was given unto me, they gave them the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. Go with what? Go with the gospel. The gospel has to be first priority. But at the same time, along with that, don't forget the poor. And so we need to keep those two in harmony and balance and Uh, If the tail wags the dog, we have a significant problem. And so much, sadly, of current day work is primarily social work with very little gospel. And we have to get the balance right. Well, the second section in verse 11 down to verse 21 is instead of Paul's private visit to Jerusalem, this is Peter's public visit to Antioch. And what we find here is in this section, Peter withdrew from table fellowship with the Gentiles. And then Paul withstood him. And so it's a it's a very interesting section because it deals with the ministry of admonition. You know, we're we're told to admonish one another. And it's not practiced very often, I think, because it's it's not easy. None of us particularly likes confrontation. And the idea of admonition is to lovingly confront somebody who is doing something wrong. And again, it's out of the right motive. 
And it has to be the right motive, but to lovingly confront someone. We don't want to do that. We we shy from that. Uh, we, we, we run away from that. But there is a time when it's necessary to lovingly confront, and sometimes even in a public way. And that's what we find in here. So the scene has shifted to Antioch. Peter is paying a visit to the church. And initially, he is happy. Excuse me. He is happy to share a meal with the Gentile Christians. No doubt this included the love feast. And uh, that was a very much a part of early Christianity that the believers would get together and share meals. Again, let's just look at a couple of references. Look at Jude, the book of Jude. Which we've already looked at once today, but Jude 11 and 12. Sorry, Jude 12. It says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now, of course, in context here, it's speaking of these false teachers who are always there. And when there's a free meal going, they're always there at the feasts of charity or these love feasts. But we, we certainly know First Corinthians 11 uh, verse 21 again, it says, For in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. And again, it's this uh, this love feast, which was quite a common thing in the early church. And of course, uh, uh, no doubt Peter was part of the love feasts in the assembly in Antioch, but he was also part of ordinary meals with the Christians. And so it seems that Peter's doing well in overcoming his Jewish prejudices in answer to what had been revealed to him in Acts chapter 10. Remember, he had uh, he, he, he had the, the vision of the net coming down and rise, kill, and eat. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And then he perceived that the Lord wanted him to go to Cornelius' household and, and, and to bring the gospel there. And so it meant eating with Gentiles. And so now uh, he's doing well. He's continuing to uh, follow this uh, this instructions that had been given to him in Acts chapter 10. And so something happens here. Certain brethren come down from the church in Jerusalem claiming to have come from James and were astounded to see Peter enjoying these social fellowship opportunities with Gentile believers. And, of course, these brethren were intimidating. And as a result of these intimidating brethren, Peter withdraws fellowship. So this is kind of the background. And so uh, Peter um, restricts his fellowship, reverts to the former Jewish way of life. Hard to imagine, have, having seen that amazing vision in Acts chapter 10 and gone to Cornelius' household, and now he's going back on everything that the Lord has shown him. And the reason is because of these men who have come down from Jerusalem. And it has really intimidated him. Uh, he's motivated not by love for the Mosaic law, but by fear of these men. And so that's kind of the background. We'll just get a couple of verses done as we look at this. And so it says in verse 11, but Peter, uh, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. The opening word, but, is a very ominous and sinister, isn't it? Uh, because they've just been given the right hand of fellowship. Everything seems to be going fine. Uh, there's absolute agreement that no burden should be put on the, the Gentiles uh, whatsoever. Just give them the gospel. They don't have to be part of the Mosaic law. But it says, but when Peter come was come to Antioch. The contrast to what has gone before, despite all that had taken place, this is what happened next. Notice too, we, we did mention Paul went up by revelation, but there's no such mention of Peter going by revelation when he goes down to Antioch. Uh, 
And it tells us that Peter was to be blamed. Literally, the idea is he he was to be condemned. Peter was to be condemned. His own actions outlined in the following verses, 12 through 14, condemned him fully. And not only so, but his conscience had been enlightened by the previous vision must also have condemned him. He must have stood condemned by his Gentile brethren for such inconsistent conduct, eating with them one minute, and then when these guys come, refusing to eat with them. And so Peter is withstood to the face because he was to be condemned or he was to be blamed. Difficulties created publicly must be dealt with publicly, especially if doctrine is at stake. Peter's withdrawal had been very public and had public repercussions. So it had to be dealt with in the same way. Now, sometimes it's wise not to wash our dirty linen in public. But on an occasion such as this, Paul felt it would be entirely wrong to have private discussions with Peter about a matter that had been done so publicly. So confrontation was necessary. And again, how difficult this is in the day we find ourselves in, because we're living in a day where um, compromise is almost accepted as norm. And who wants to confront But Paul was fearless. Interesting. Peter's gripped by fear. He's frightened of these these intimidating men coming down from Jerusalem. But Paul is fearless. Not even a man like Peter, with all his authority and stature, could be allowed to act in such a way. As Paul had not yielded to the Judaizers in chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, We gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. So he would not retreat before Peter. What he had fought for at Jerusalem, he was now upholding, defending, and vindicating at Antioch. He was demonstrating his complete independence of the other apostles. And this is important in terms of the overall letter to the Galatians. He's telling us, I'm not intimidated by the apostles. I'm going to stand for the gospel uh, at all costs. And again, we'd say this, not only do we, I mean, so many practical lessons in our study today. I don't know if you're seeing it, but I I see so much need here. The need for pillars in the church, the need for compassion for the poor. And then the third thing is we need men of conviction, men who will stand against error at at a high cost. None of us like confrontation. Many of us, I would rather go jogging and I hate jogging. Let me just, you probably could see that by looking at me, but rather than confront somebody, But there are times when you have to do the right thing, no matter how painful. And of course, I think the very fact that you don't like it is even better. If you're somebody who likes confrontation and loves a a fight, you're probably the wrong person. (laughs) Uh, It's really, we need to go in uh, dependence on the Lord. Uh, We need to go um, with, with great care as we do this. Uh, but we need to do it. And so Paul confronts. And we want to look at the reasons why, and uh, we'll just maybe break into verse 12. It says, for, and so here's the reason, here's the reason that he was withstood to the face. He says, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, that were of the circumcision. And what we could say is this, that what's behind all this, and we've said it before, it's not love of the Mosaic law, it's fear of man. Fear of man bringeth a snare. How many of us have been impacted by powerful brethren and have cowered in fear rather than standing for liberty. This is a common problem, brethren, and we have to be careful that we do not, are not intimidated by men 
but our convictions are entirely from the scriptures. And if that's the case, then we'll withstand the pressure of men. But Lord, deliver us from the fear of men. Our time is gone. May the Lord enable us this coming week to not in any way be brought into bondage by the fear of men. Amen.